this video we're going to discuss the solutions to the final exam on basic statistics. Exam contains two parts. The first part contains 10 multiple choice questions and the second part contains the problems which we need to solve. So let's go through the questions of the first part. I'm going to show you the question description with the options. You need to press the pause in order to try to answer by yourself. Then I'm going to show you the answer and explain the answer. The first question is we're going to take uh, collect the data from the customers of the web service they need to provide the gender male or female and they are uh, we're asked you indicate the level of measurement of this data so we are going to measure this data on the nominal level so the nominal level measurement is characterized by by the names by the labels or categories so this is the data which cannot be sorted or ordered by some way. So the second question, so which graph is best for peer data containing the shoe size and the height of pseudo randomly selected students? Right, so it is like when the data comes in a pair and the best way to show this is the skater plot. It's a plot where I would like to put the point depending on the shoe size and the height. So this is very good tool in order to see the dependency of the two data sets. For example, in this data set, we can see that the shoe size depends on height. So since the shoe size is getting bigger and bigger, the height is also getting higher and higher. So a measurement, numerical measurement of the population. So we're asked to, to tell what is the numerical measurement of the population in this question. This is the parameter. So this is kind of a numerical problem. A number is drawn randomly from a box. So probability that it's going to be less than 10, it's 20%, 0 0.2. Probability that this is more than 50 is 10% or 0 0.1. Then the probability that it is between 10 and 50, it's going to be one minus this part and this part, this is going to be 0 0.7. So problem number five is about the central limit theorem. So let me remind you what does it mean, the, what was the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that if you're given in identically and independently distributed random variables, then their sum has a normal distribution for large enough n, whereas the mean, which is n multiplied to the mean of each of this random variable, and with the variance, which is n multiplied to the variance of each random variable. So the statement when, uh, when it says that the sum is going to have the normal distribution when the sample size is smaller for small n, it is false because the central limit theorem tells me that for a large enough n, so this sum is going to have the normal distribution. So problem number six, it's also theoretical. As the number of degrees of freedom increases, the T distribution gets closer and closer to the normal distribution. From this graph, we can see that as we increase the K, it's going to be closer and closer to the normal distribution. So this statement is true. So problem number seven, what is the value of the confidence level for the T-tail test if the significance level is 0 0.1? So T-tail test means that the areas on the boss tails, their sum should be equal to the level of significance, right? So the level of significance is 10%. It means that this area plus this area is 0 0.1. Then the area in the middle is going to be 0 0.9 since the total area under this curve is equal to the 1. Number 8, the Shanghai municipal government would like to claim that significantly uh, would would like to claim that significantly fewer than five percent of its residents drive private automobiles to work, right? So this is about the proportion of the population, right? So it says that the proportion of the population is less than five, five percent. Um, which means that this is the alternative hypothesis. So we need to go to, uh, to the option where alternative hypothesis is less than five. And the null hypothesis, it's a complement of the alternative hypothesis. This is going to be bigger or equal to the five. So this is the correct answer. Problem number nine, assume we would like to test the null hypothesis mu is equal to the 100 against the alternative hypothesis mu is not equal to the 100 which kind of test we need to use. So when we need to choose the test type, 
we need to go through, we need to look to the sign of the alternative hypothesis. If it has the bigger sign, then we're going to use the right tail test. If it has a smaller size, then we're going to use the left tail test. If it has non-equality sign, we're going to use a T-tail test. And the last problem on the first section is it is necessary to test the claim on the standard deviation of the population of IQ scores of a Facebook friends. So we know that the we are if we are going to test the uh, claim on standard deviation, we need to use the distribution of the standard deviations, which is called the chi-square distribution. So the table of the chi-square distribution tells us uh, some areas and the values on the distribution of the standard deviation. So let's go through the second part, problems. So suppose a football player has a penalty shot percentage of 74%. It means that every time when he shoots a penalty, there is a probability that 74% uh, that it's going to be a goal. So in a given football year, he takes 21 penalty shots. What is the average number of the goals and standard deviation of the number of the goals he will make? So the number of the goals which he is going to shoot in n trials in 21 trials is going to have the binomial distribution with the probability of success in a single trial is 0.74 so that is why the mean is going to be calculated as by multiplying n to the p which is going to be 21 multiplied to the 0.74 and the standard deviation is calculated by this formula npq from the square root which is going to be 2.01 Problem number two, there are 12 questions in this section. If you guess at random the answer for every question in the section, what is the probability that you will get at least one correct answer? Again, so um, there are 12 questions in the section in four, let's say four options for each of the question, right? So then the number of the question which you're going to answer correctly has the binomial distribution with the probability of success 25%, 1 over 4, because one answer out of 4 is correct, and probability of fail is 3 over 4, because 3 of the answers out of 4 are wrong, are, are false answers. So we need to go through the 12 questions, and we need to count the number of the correct answers, number of the successful trials, right? So probability that we'll get at least one correct answer means, like, number of the successful trials, number of the correct answers should be more or equal to the 1 and we can find this by subtracting probability of x is less than 1 which is 0 from the 1. So probability that x is equal to the 0 can be calculated using the formula for the binomial distribution. It's going to be combination of 12 and 0, p in the power of 0, q in the power of 12 which is going to be simply q in the power of 12 which is 0.03 so that is why the probability that we're going to answer at least one correct answer by guessing it's going to be 96.8%. Problem number three, a newspaper article reports that in a poll of 120 randomly selected voters, 55% are going to support the candidate A in the elections. So there are only two candidates and they report the result accurate was in the 3% of the error margin. So what confidence level they use in order to make this result? So this is about the confidence interval of the proportions, right? So when we uh, would like to claim the interval estimate of the population proportion, we say that we take the sample, we calculate the proportion of the sample, and we're going to construct the interval around the sample uh, samples proportion using the error margin which can be calculated using this formula right so in our case we are given error margin which is going to be 3% and the number of the sample the size of the sample probability uh, proportion of the sample which is 0 0.55 and proportion of the uh, and the Q which is going to be 1 minus proportion of the sample which is going to be 0 0.45. So from here we need to just find the critical point because it, it will allow us to find the confidence level, right? So if I put everything to the formula and find the Z, it is going to be 0 0.6 to 6, 
it means that this point is going to be 0 0.66 and this point is minus 0 0.66 so if I would like to find the confidence level I need to find the area in between these two critical points so in order to do this I will go to the table of the standard deviation standard normal distribution so it will tell me that the area until minus 0 0.66 is 0 0.25 so that is why the area after 0 0.66 is also 0 0.25. So that is why the area in between is going to be 1 minus 2 multiplied to the 0 0.25, which is roughly 0 0.49. So the level of confidence at which the result has been presented is roughly 49%. Problem number 4. The average grade points of a large population of university students are approximately random distributed was the mean 2.2 and the standard deviation 0.6. Suppose that uh, four students are randomly selected from a student body. What is the probability that average grade of them is more than 2.91? So basically, we are going to take a sample, right, and calculate the average of the sample. And we assume that the average of the sample has a normal distribution uh, because usually the grades have the normal distribution. And in this case, uh, we are not going to use the T distribution because we know the standard deviation of the population. Okay, so the pop so since the population has a normal distribution, then the sample's mean is going to have also the normal distribution. So in order to test, uh, in order to find the probability that the sample's mean is more than 2.91, we need to calculate the test statistic, the z-score of this 2.91. We calculate this by subtracting the mean, the population mean, which is going to be 2.2, and dividing this to the sigma um, divided to the 2. Okay, so 2.91 minus 2.2 divided to the uh, sigma, which is 0 0.6, divided to the t, which is square root of 4. So, which is going to be 2.76. So, we need to find the probability that, uh, the, find the area after z is equal to the 2.76, which is going to be 0 0.30. So, problem 2.5. So, how large the sample size should be? So, what is the size of the sample for the estimating the population proportion? Was the error margin 3% at the level of confidence 95%? So we need to again use the formula of the error margin for the population proportions and since we are, we are not given the p hat and q hat, we're just going to take them as 0.5. So in this formula, we're just going to put here p hat and q hat as 0.5. Z is going to be at the critical point which corresponds to the 95% of level of confidence which is equal to 1.96. It means that the area between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96 is equal to 0 0.95. And the error margin is going to be 3%. If we put everything there, it is going to be 0 1,068. So we need to take at least 1,068 people to our sample in order to make the estimate of the population proportion within the error margin 3%. So a researcher is interested in determining if one can predict the gasoline efficiency from the speed of vehicle. Okay, so in this case, we need to define what is the dependent variable and independent variable. So we need to use the speed of the vehicle as the independent variable, right? So we would like to know depending on what speed of the vehicle we are going to drive it, it is how what is going to be the um, its uh, fuel expenses. So problem number 2.7 it's very numerical example so we need to we're given two data sets X and Y and we need to calculate the regression uh, the correlation coefficient and the regression line. So the correlation coefficient is the measurement of the strengths of the correlation, the dependency of the two variables, and also its direction. So it is calculated using this formula. So when it is so this r is going to be between minus 1 and 1. So if in the module this number is going to be bigger and bigger, it means that there is a stronger correlation between the two variables. And if the number r is less than zero, it means that there is a 
uh, indirect correlation between the two variables. It means that when one is increasing, the second one is decreasing. And when R is positive, it means that there is a direct correlation between the two variables. It means that one is increasing, the second one is increasing as well. So in order to calculate the correlation coefficient for this data points, for this data, we just need to uh, put everything here, plug everything here and calculate the correlation coefficient. This is going to be 0 0.87. So for the same problem, we need to calculate the regression line. So let's assume that we see that there is a correlation, so a strong correlation between the two variables. I would like to figure out the line which would predict me the dependency of these two variables. So we write down the regression line as any line in the form of y is equal to the mx plus b and we're going to find the slope and the y-intercept b using the formulas. So m is calculated using this formula. In order to calculate the m we just need to plug everything here. This is going to be 1.07 and in order to calculate the b we need to use this formula. We again are going to plug everything in here and we're going to get the answer minus 0.23 and the equation of the regression line is equal to the 1.07x minus 0.23. So now in this problem, we need to make the analysis of the distribution. So um, the analysis of the police department shows that the distribution of the 840 robbers over the week days is given like this. So we need to test the hypothesis that the distribution has the uniform distribution with a level of significance 10%. So this is the test when we are going to uh, when we're going to uh, t t like a test the hypothesis that the random variable has some distribution. This kind of hypothesis test is called like a chi-square goodness to fit test, right? Uh, it means uh, it's like whether so we expect that the distribution of the robbers has the uniform distribution and we observe some data and we just need to test this hypothesis. Okay, so we expect that every day it's going to be 120 robberies. Uh, in this case it's going to be uniform distribution and we observe that on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday the number of the variables, the number of the robberies and we need to calculate the test statistic using this formula where we subtract the observed data from the expected. So we expect 120 robberies per day. And we need to square them and sum them and divide them every time to the 120. And we're going to get the value 5.53. This is going to be our test statistic. So we need to compare our test statistic with the critical value. So we can find a critical value of the chi-square, the right critical value, by defining the degrees of freedom. So here I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 groups, or, um, and the sample size in our case is 7. So that is why degrees of freedom is going to be 6. So level of significance is 10%. So just using this like a, this data, so the level of significance and degrees of freedom, we can find the right critical point from the chi-square table. It is going to be 10.65. So I need to make the conclusion about the hypothesis of the police department, which tells me that the distribution is going to have the uniform distribution, right? So test the hypothesis that the distribution of the robberies per weekday is not uniform. Okay. It's not uniform distribution. Okay, so in order to do this, so I found a critical point here of the chi-square distribution, which corresponds to the level of significance of 10%. Critical point is 10.65. And test statistic is 5.53, which is not in the rejection region, right? So it means that we are going to support the null hypothesis but since our claim is about the alternative hypothesis we need to reject this so we need to choose one of these answers to make the conclusion so we're going to choose this one at the level of significance 10 percent there is not enough evidence to support this claim that the uh, distribution of the robberies have not uniform distribution during the weekdays um, in a sample, so let's go to the problem 2.9. In a sample random survey of 89 teachers of high school, 73 say that they 
it was the most satisfying, most enjoyable semester that Rave ever had. So established a 98% of the confidence interval to estimate the population proportion of the high school teachers. So we are uh, so in order to make the confidence interval on the population uh, of the proportion, so we need to take the sample. We took a sample of 89 teachers. And we found that 73 said yes, they have satisfied with the semester. So the sample proportion is going to be 73 over 89. And we're going to estimate the population proportion by finding the error margin and subtracting the error margin from the sample proportion and by adding the error margin to the sample proportion. So we are going to calculate the error margin using this formula. So which Z here is co uh, correspond to the level of confidence. So if you have the level of confidence of 98%, then the critical point is going to be 2.33. So basically, um, so the area between minus 2.3 and 2.33 under the standard normal distribution curve is going to be 0.98. We multiply this as a 0.82, which is the ratio of the 73 over 89. Multiply it to the 0 0.18, which is 1 minus 0 0.82, divide it to the 89, which is equal to the sample size. Right? We're going to get 0 0.095, and our estimation interval estimate of the population proportion is going to be samples proportion plus minus the error margin. So this is again a practical question, problem 3.1. So parents of Nagina recorded the heights at a very various ages up to six to six months. So below there was a table. So of the so here at every age they have recorded the height. So it is forty six they recorded the height and so on until six to six months. So from here we've got we fill out the table in order to uh, so we would like to identify whether the age and the height has the dependency or not. Okay, so in this case, independent variable is going to be the age, right? Because dependent, so we would like to choose some age, and we would like to see what is the height here, and the dependent variable is going to be the height. Depending on this, we're going to define the correlation coefficient. So let's calculate the correlation coefficient. We need to calculate the correlation coefficient using this formula where the x is going to be the age and y is going to be the height. So we just need to fill up this table. So this is going to be x squared, y squared, x multiplied to the 8. And we need to have the sums, right? So instead of sum of the x, we're going to use 216. Instead of sum of the y, we're going to use 513. Instead of sum of the x, y, it's, we're going to use 27,378. So sum of x squared is going to be 14,284 and sum of y squared is going to be 53,000, 0.81. If you substitute all of this data, uh, n is going to be, in our case, it's just 5. So if you, sum, uh, if you put all of this data, we're going to get the correlation coefficient 0.99.7. It means that they are very much correlated. So in the second problem, we need to calculate the regression line. We need to get regression line. With we first of all are going to calculate the slope of this line, and then we need to calculate the y-intercept of this line. So we can calculate the slope of this line using this formula, and by substituting all the data here, we can calculate that m is equal to 0.89, and by putting all the data here, we can calculate that the y-intercept is going to be 55.71.